All right. Welcome, everybody, to another Renko webinar. Um, today, I'm honored to welcome Lynn Cleary as a guest speaker, uh, who will talk about advanced security management within Office 365. My name is Matthias Seidel, the other Mat Matthias from Rancor. Uh, I'm pretty much doing everything marketing. And um, yeah, let's let introduce uh, Liam himself. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Liam. I'm a Microsoft MVP and have been for 11 years now. And I also work as uh, an architect for a company here in the US uh, called Protivity. And I kind of consult on everything SharePoint, Office 365. My kind of focus area has been security and compliance for quite some time. Um, so I'm really excited to talk through advanced security management with you uh, today. All right. Thank you, Liam. Um, just some quick words about how this webinar is going to go down. Uh, we will record the entire webinar, and uh, you will receive an email containing a link to the recording afterwards. So everyone who signed up. Uh, we'll receive this this email. If you have any questions during the webinar, um, please use the Q&A functionality. You should have a, a button somewhere in your Zoom window um, to where you're able to basically type down your questions and send them to us. And at the end of the webinar, we'll try to answer all of them, uh, at least a couple of them, um, if possible, um, to stay within our time slot or maybe just overrun a little bit. Um, for all the unanswered questions we should have, um, we'll try to review and answer them af afterwards within the webinar recordings page. Yeah, so with that, I would like to hand it over to Liam. Um, thanks again for joining us today, and uh, let's get started. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, the focus of today is advanced security management within Office 365. So we'll kind of talk about some of the basics. Um, I'm not going to kill you with PowerPoint slides. I'll have a few to go through, and then I would rather go straight to the site and kind of walk you through advanced security management. So I suppose the first thing to understand is the purpose of advanced security management within Office 365. So our, our first goal is to see how your organization's data in Office 365 is accessed and used. You know what it's like working in the SharePoint space. If we talk about that for a while, you often don't who's uploading files, who's downloading, who's deleting, and often who's taking those files away. Um, it also allows us to control access to Office 365 data within those mobile devices. You know, as given a world where everybody has a cell phone, a mobile phone, a tablet, whatever it would be, and they want the data on the move. But obviously controlling who can do that, how often, and whether it's encrypted, for example, is also an important step as part of that security management. Having the ability to define policies that trigger alerts for what we would class as atypical or suspicious activities. And one of those, for example, could be a suspicious logon or what's called an impossible logon, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But basically the idea of I log in to 365 from one country and then literally a minute later, I log in from an impossible location and then Office 365 will see that. And we can define a policy for things like that. We can also suspend user accounts that exhibit suspicious activity. You know, a suspicious activity type, for example, could be somebody who's downloading vast amounts of data from the 365 site. Now, that may not sound like a major issue. But in reality, we've all probably worked in SharePoint for long enough and OneDrive that it's not that easy to just download lots of data. And um, so if somebody's chosen to download that, then maybe that could be suspicious. Somebody taking internal IP from your company. We can also require users to log back into Office 365 if something is captured, an alert's been triggered. That's a kind of a basic security mechanism to say, well, hey, Liam logged in something happened, he violated a policy which flagged an alert, let's make him log back in again to prove that it's him. So if the account was compromised, you know, at least we could capture that. And then of course, we can create a security dashboard. Everybody likes dashboards, everybody likes to see bars and charts that kind of explain the numbers of what's going on, you know, how many people have done A, B, and C. 
So that's kind of the purpose of advanced security management. Now, from a licensing perspective, it's really important to understand how we license 365 advanced security management, or what's referred to as ASM. It's part of the E5 Office 365 license by default. So you'll get that if you're at the E5 level. If you're not using an E5 365 license, then you can add it to your existing license as a separate add-in. And this can be combined with other licenses. So for example, if you're E3 users, you can then add ASM and you'll see for the US pricing, for example, it's $3 a user per month. The key is here, every single user in your organization, if you want to use advanced security management, needs to be licensed for that. Even though the end user in reality doesn't see any benefit from that, it's more of a IT security type function, still needs to be licensed for that. There's also some other licenses that we can kind of look at which go beyond the E5 license too, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. So what are some of the core features? Well, the first feature is threat detection. I always love that phrase. It sounds very grand, something really important. It's about detecting threats in the organization. Then, of course, we have what's called enhanced control, which is the ability after we've inspected the logs and everything else that comes in, we can then apply controls to that. So, for example, controlling an application and determining whether it's allowed to have access to Office 365. And then, of course, we have discovery and insights. The threat detection is all about identifying high-risk, abnormal usage and security incidents, and that's using some behavioral technology in the background. Enhanced control is about granular controls and security policies that you can define. Now, there are some out-of-the-box policies, but you can obviously use those or you can create your own policies based on specific sets of criteria. And we'll walk through that in a moment. And then discovery and insights just gives you enhanced visibility into Office 365 usage, especially when you combine this with for example, the audit log components in 365, or even the content search components, it'll give you a full picture of what somebody may be doing. So I suppose the, the user story is something's got flagged up. You know, Liam's been trying to download lots of data. We're not quite sure what that data is. We just know it's being downloaded. So we can then look at the, the in, initial audit logs that come through and check what I've been doing. So I can start to build a picture and then determine what the outcome should be. So for threat detection, it covers specific areas, is looking at user activities. So what it does, it looks at you as an individual user and monitors what you do. It looks at what your normal set of working would be and then kind of takes a baseline for that one. So, for example, if you just opened up email every day and wrote a few Word documents and went to OneDrive, that would be the pattern it would create. If you suddenly started then running remote PowerShell to delete things, that would potentially get flagged up because that's not your normal user activity. It can also capture administrator activity, and that's one of the first things that gets set, and captures even what I would do as administrator. So even me, or you as an admin, isn't excluded from this process. It uses behavioral analytics, which is captured from some of the undercover components that are part of the Azure and Office 365 stack to kind of base it around what your normal behavior would be. And then, of course, it brings in what's called Microsoft Insights. So Microsoft have a threat detection core service that they utilize and run, and Office 365 and Azure are fed from that component. So some of the latest threats that would be out there are moved into Office 365 so that they can also be captured. Now for enhanced control, it's all about activity policies. So what type of activity are you doing and applying a policy to that? So are we uploading, are we downloading? Do we want to capture something when everybody checks in a page, for example, in SharePoint? The controls are location and device aware. So for example, by IP address, by country, is it a Windows machine, is it a Mac machine, is it a, a mobile device, is it a tablet? We can obviously define controls based on that too. It's also user aware. It knows exactly who the person is, 
nobody ever tells you it's all anonymous. It's not. It knows exactly who you are. It's big brother. It monitors you by name and knows exactly what you have done. And then we can notify an alert. And this is great because I can specify notifications to go to me. I can, spend, I can send something to somebody else like a manager or I can send an alert to a security officer that needs to obviously make a change or speak to the individual. For discovery and insights, it's all about the dashboard. Right when we go into ASM, there's a dashboard that's available that you can see uh, some basic information. It does app discovery. So for example, it will see the kinds of apps that are trying to connect to Office 365 and we'll be able to register those apps, whether it's a SharePoint Online or OneDrive or Office 365 or something else, you will see those apps and it will do some automatic discovery on those apps. Um, it's also about shadow IT control. Now obviously ASM is the, the smaller brother of the big brother component, which is cloud app security, which we, we, we'll talk about a little bit later as well. But shadow IT control, it's about understanding which people are trying to almost circumvent the components that you have. Now you all may know that there, there are those individuals probably in your organization that will always use something else other than what you can provide. And that's the shadow IT control. And then we have this great feature where you can bring your on-premises logs. So for example, let's say you have a checkpoint firewall or a Cisco firewall or something else. You can dump those log files and then import them directly into ASM to augment the actual log files that come through. Because one thing that Office 365 does, and I suppose it's a core thing to understand, is it only looks at things that are trying to connect to the 365 services, nothing else. But if you have traffic coming from your organization and going through a firewall to get to something, it has no concept of that data. So that would be something that you could then upload into the system and you'd be able to see that as well. So that's enough of me talking about that. Let's go straight to a demo and look at ASM. I'm just going to move between the windows. OK, so I'm within my Office 365 portal. And what I wanted to do first was just to actually come and look at the kind of the services that are available. Because obviously, when we look into purchase services, and um, there's a whole host of them here, but some of the services that are available, so if I do security, you'll see that we have what's called Enterprise Mobility and Security E5. This license here is beyond the E5 license and will allow you some extra uh, Active Directory Premium components and will actually allow you to use the Cloud App security pieces that are available. Then we have a dedicated cloud app security, and I'll talk about the difference in a few minutes. Then we have the license here, the advanced security management license that is available. And then you can see we have an E3 security and enterprise. So there's a few different licenses that are available to us. Obviously, I'm just showing US prices, but obviously it's different world round. So there's different components that we can add to the existing licensing. Now, when you want to use advanced security management, you will need to apply that license to every single user that wishes to be a participant of that one. Obviously, if you've got 50,000 people in the company and you're paying the equivalent of $3 a user because you haven't got an E5, that can soon add up. So you can batch it into specific groups. So for example, I could go into Azure AD behind this, create a group, assign a license to those individuals, and then just utilize the security and compliance advanced security management pieces just for those individual users. This is a great place to go from a security management perspective. It's not just the entry point to ASM, but it's also an entry point to lots of other components uh, that are very, very useful. Now, one of, one of these components um, is all about alerts. And this is where we're going to start. So in alerts, we have the ability to render a dashboard of anything that's violated some of the basic alerts that you may have. And this is just Office 365. If I click on alert policies, you'll see that there are some base ones here. And though it's not specifically related to advanced security management, 
some of these are really important to notice because you may not need to go into advanced security management to get some of this. So for example, elevation of an exchange admin or unusual external user file activity. These are ones that are built in out of the system and you can utilize these. We can click into them and then you'll get some obviously settings that come through and it explains what these are. So as part of a security management process, come and look at these from the alert, define alert policies. If I click new alert policy, I'm just gonna give it some random text for, for a second. I'm gonna pick it as a high policy. I wanna, for example, pick which category it sits in, so threat management. I can then go through and create my alert settings. I can choose my list of activities. So this, this is just some basic ability to look at activities that take place within Office 365. And this piece right here, what's great, does not require a specific license for advanced security management. But it's limited. It's got a good set of specific functions that you can use. So for example, I wanna look for someone that's been downloading files to the computer. I can then go into here and say, hey, I want to, this is the condition to get that information. So every time something matches it, or maybe when the volume matches a certain thing. So if this gets popped up 15 activities during 60 minutes, then this is probably a problem. So I want to specify that as my condition. And I can then say, send me an email. I'm not going to specify a limit. And then I can say finish and that will add my alert. Now from that point forward, whenever anybody's downloading files to a computer, if it meets this criteria, I get notified. Now that's great, I'm just gonna cancel this one, I don't need to save that. But it's great, but it's just inside. Now ASM spans everything within the Office 365 service. So it's a little bit greater than just the regular alerting process. So if I click Manage Advanced Alerts, you'll see that what it does, it comes right here. Now, the very first time you come here, you have to enable advanced security management. So you won't get the go-to. You'll have an option that will say, yep, I want to enable advanced security management. And then this link will appear. So I'm going to click go to advanced security management. Now, for the purposes of this demo, I'm actually going to be running inside cloud app security instead of ASM but I'm gonna explain the differences to you as part of this process. But the interface is basically the same. The only thing that's different is it'll say cloud app security here instead of saying advanced security management. But I wanted to kind of span both of them because as far as a security management process goes, they're almost identical except cloud app security has a few other bits and pieces. Now first off, I can click on the dashboard and I'm using Cloud App Security, so I get access to a few more bits and pieces. So this is kind of like a, a quick sell to you, that if you really want to go all out, full Big Brother and control everything, then Cloud App Security is where you want to go. Uh, Advanced Security Management is a subset of this. So here's my dashboard. You can see it's given me, these are the files that have been monitored, these are my accounts. I've got 6,500 activities that have been monitored. And then it gives you a breakdown of specific apps as well as different risk types. So this is a great, a great way to see it. And of course, if you have alerts that have come up, you can see the alerts, I can see the violations, the content violations, et cetera. Now, of course, this is just me using a tenant, so I don't obviously have loads of violations here. But if I wanna look at the activities, I can simply click on the number, and this will take me to the activity log. Now, the activity log does literally log everything. So as we scroll down, I'm just gonna give you a kind of a rundown of some of the pieces. You can see, for example, I've got Exchange logging in, and then you'll see I'm trying to access a file from OneDrive, and notice it tells me it's a PC, it's running Windows 10, and it was using Chrome. So instantly, I get more information about an activity than I would if I was using the regular alerts, because I can now see exactly what's going on. So if we take this activity, for example, and just click into it, you'll see that this was basically me getting my image, just something that was loaded, you know, my regular thumb image for my account. And you can see the dates, the IP address it came from, information about the device, what groups I would have belonged to, where it was coming from. So obviously this is coming from where I am right now. My ISP, 
as well as I can view the raw data at this point, and this gives you a JSON object that you can actually see more information about that. So this gives me you know, the list item object I was trying to get to. So I can actually download that. And if you have another application that supports JSON, this is great to be able to bring these out and then augment other applications with the JSON information that comes back. So that was just a quick 30 second stop. Now really, this is where we kind of control everything. So you'll see in the Discover, this is where I can upload logs from on-premises. Now obviously, we, I'm not gonna go through that process today because that would require having to have a checkpoint firewall or something else and bringing it all in. What I'm gonna focus on is these three options here. And I'll explain the differences between ASM and Cloud App Security. So when I click Investigate, if you're using Advanced Security Management, you'll basically get the activity log and you'll get app permissions and files. You basically get a subset of this menu. When you're using Cloud App Security, obviously I get a whole host of information that's available. Now when I click Control, it's exactly the same menu, policies and templates. Now obviously there are extra policies and templates available in Cloud App Security versus ASM. So let's start by looking at some of the templates that are available in the system. So by default, you can see, for example, a new popular app. So this will alert you when new apps are discovered. Um, unauthorized domains, multiple failed logins, uh, be anomalous behavior from a user, CRM compliance, uh, high upload volumes, mass downloads by single users, a risky app. Obviously, you might wonder how that works, but there's, there's a process built in. Uh, user logon from non-categorized IP, potential ransomware, file containing PII, and then we can keep scrolling down to the core templates. And there's pages of these templates that are available. And you can see that the DLP engine components are also being built into ASM in order to bring that information through. Now you can define a policy. If I click policies, you can see that there's some base ones here. So for example, administrative activity from a non-administrative IP address, or that was one I created, log on from a risky IP address, and this was me testing, logging in, for example, through an anonymous proxy or through Tor, and then trying to access back and having that flag to say, hey, someone's coming in from a risky IP address. So you can create a policy very simply here, and you can select the template type that you wish to use. So if we're gonna use an activity policy, which tends to be the standard one, I'm simply gonna click activity policy. This is gonna take me to the activity policy creation where I can then select any of the templates or no template. So for example, multiple failed user logon attempts, mass downloads, um, administrative activity, or I could say no template whatsoever, and I will call this, uh, we'll call it demo Rencore policy. I can then also add a description. I can specify what kind of policy severity. So let's say this is high. I can then come back and change it and say, it's not really a threat detection. It's more of a privileged account or a sharing or someone's made a configuration change. I can then change that to the category. All that means is that when something is logged that matches that, it gets tagged in the activity log. So if I go back to the activity log here, you can see that in the activity types, I can actually come in and select some of those activity types and I can filter the information. And when something gets flagged in there, I can then see what that would sit in. So choosing the type will obviously allow you to filter the information more effectively. So I'm gonna choose threat detection. What I'm then gonna do is a create a filter for the policy. So I can either do a single activity or a repeated activity. So I could say every activity that matches the filter, and then we get this great kind of design. I actually really, really like the way that we build this information. So you'll see, for example, here I can say, well, let's pick an activity type. I can say I need that to equal, and then I can go in and say access a file. So for example, I can say every time this activity takes place, which is access a file. Now, I would suggest that you didn't do that one because that would obviously pick up every single time. So maybe it's, you know, maybe you want to capture 
sharing invites or maybe access requests or sharing an access and then take off access. Notice you can multi-select and you can see them listed. So you can quickly build quite complex components. I can then either leave it as that or I can click the plus sign and then start to add other. So for example, I may want to capture activity types that equal those on a specific device and say, I want that to be on a PC. So you can see we can now start to craft something very specific. And then we can do one more. We'll scroll down and say, I'm going to pick an IP address, for example. And I can pick a filter and say my raw, raw IP address starts with 70, for example. Now, obviously, that's a, a bit of a strange one, but you can actually go through and say, well, there's this weird IP address that keeps connecting to things. Um, it begins with this, or it's this specific IP address. Add that in, and then that becomes part of that process. So once you have defined, you can actually click Edit and Preview Results. Now, of course, the odds are it's not going to find something that matches this, but it will then look at the current log. Now obviously a precursor to this, if you're trying to build these rules and you've only just enabled advanced security management, obviously the list isn't going to come back with anything. So just be aware, once you enable it, it will take at least 24 hours for the existing information that's in Office 365 to be pulled into ASM before you can start seeing it in the investigation logs and before you can start doing the test. I can then create an alert. I can then send the alert as an email. And for example, I can go in and say, you know, I want to, let's do Liam at Microsoft.com, for example, as an, as an email address. Uh, uh, I forgot what me. Uh, so I could pick an email address that I wish to use. I could then also say, well, send me a text. So. You know, if I was going to be in the UK, I could say plus four, four, blah, 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 and then a number. Obviously, there's too many numbers, but I can specify that number. And then, obviously, that's going to send me an email, and it's going to send me a text. You can specify those, and it can be more than one. It could be a, it could be a security-enabled group, or it could be individual user accounts. And then from a governance perspective at the bottom, if we expand all apps you'll see that we can notify the user. So not just send this person, so send me at yes.com an email. I can notify the user. I can also notify the user's manager and then pick other individuals that I wish to, know, to send a notification to. Now, just think that through. Obviously, I mentioned earlier that it's not anonymous. And here, you can see that, that just because Liam did something this system knows who the manager is of that individual. Obviously, that captures that information. I can then suspend the user, for example, for Azure AD accounts. I can tell it to require a, single, uh, a sign on again for that user. Or within Office 365, I can suspend the account there. So you have the ability to kind of do it in both areas. So I can suspend an account. So in my, in my scenario here, if I did a folder sharing invitation, a file sharing invitation, and I was on a PC and my IP address began with 70, then an email would get notified, my boss would get notified, it would suspend my Azure AD account, it would require me to log back in, which obviously wouldn't make any sense because my account's been suspended, and then my Office 365 access account would be suspended. And then, of course, I can uh, send, a, send a message customize the notification message, and I can say, you have been locked out. And then that creates my rule. So I can click Create. This will go ahead and create my policy. You can, you can see it going backwards and forwards, and there's my policy that's been created. Now, at any point, you can click on the gear icon, and it will take you back where you can modify those settings. And when those settings have been done, you can simply click Update, and that rule is updated instantly. I can also then disable or delete the rule at any point by coming back into here and choosing disable. Now, when you choose the disable, it's obviously going to say, are you sure? Yes, I am. And then it obviously gets tagged as disabled. So, that, so that's creating of a policy. Now, once those policies are in place, obviously, it will just start working naturally. Now, what about if 
you don't know what the policies are that you want to create. And this is normally where I would suggest you start, that you may not know what you want to capture, you may not know what you want to be alerted on, and definitely you don't want to be notified on everything. Nobody wants to get that many emails. I'm a great advocate of choose wisely the specific notifications you wish to get, otherwise it becomes useless at that point because everybody then creates a rule in Outlook to just delete those emails that come through. Uh, I, I do the same thing. So an easier option is to go to the activity log. If we look at the activity log, we get a list of the types of activities that are taking place. So for example, you'll see that there were some commands that were ran. If I keep clicking through next and paging through the information, you'll start to get a picture of what individual users are doing in the system. So there's lots and lots of these run commands. Now, if I wanted to pick one of these and say this access file one that we looked at before, I can then look at this information and I can then determine what I want to do with this. Now, if I go here and click on the right, you'll see that I can also view activity of the same type. I can view all the user activity for that specific user or from the same IP address or from the same country or region. So if I choose same IP address, for example, you'll notice this is this now filters. Oh, and there we go. There's some updated activity that we literally just did. So you can see that it's even capturing like that activity as we go through. I can then come through and specify the users. So I can say, actually, I'm going to use my Liam account. I could pick any of the other accounts that I've got. And this will then filter to just me. Now, once we've got this information, you'll see we have a button here that says new policy from search. So notice the, the criteria. We've got username is this one. IP address is this. So let's go through and select an activity. And I could pick any of these activities up front. So let's say we're going to choose access file. This will then limit the results even further. So now we have three sets of filter that we're applying to the list. So this should give me everything that Liam from this IP address accessed. We'll give that a second to load. But while that's loading, there we go. That's all the files that I tried to access. I can then click new policy from search. Or what I could do is click advanced right here. And then we go back to that nice way. So if you're trying to understand how to construct the queries correctly, if you go into basic mode, do the filtering, then click advanced, it will then explain and show you how to build those. I much prefer building them this way. It's kind of, yeah, I suppose in some respects, it's almost like SQL type based where it's like select IP address, you know, and raw IP address where it begins with this, etc. So once you have the criteria correct, new policy from search will take you to the new screen where what you'll see is it doesn't pick a template, but when you get to here, that's all been copied automatically over. So this is a great way if you don't know what you want to capture. Don't create the policies yet. Let it log the information over the next, you know, I always say give it, give it a couple of weeks for it to start building a picture of your organization and then go through the log and start creating the activities and the, and the policies that you need to have. So I could then create a, a policy from this one uh, change a few settings, send an email address, the, the, the same thing that we did previously. So it's a very simple process. It's just easier to kind of look at what's going on. Now, of course, we can also do locations, and they have obviously all the countries in the world that you can go through, so I can say everything in the US. And then it will start to obviously filter information out. Now, what's important is actually the app, and this gives you a list of the apps that are currently connecting to your Office 365 in some instance, or are actually part of Office 365 that are registered. So for example, Exchange Online, Power BI, Microsoft Teams, whatever it would be. So if I click Microsoft Teams, this will filter out the activity and say, hey, has anybody in your organization tried to use Microsoft Teams in the US? And then give me that same information back. So there's a list of apps that you can see and you'll see that we have connected apps listed here. Now, if I click connected apps, you'll see that I have OneDrive for Business, SharePoint Online, and Office 365. Now, if I wanted to, because I'm using cloud app security, 
I can actually add other applications. So I can then start to bring in, for example, if we're using Dropbox, I can then start to see Dropbox notifications come through because obviously you're now going to protect Dropbox via Cloud App Security and Office 365 and Azure, and then I can start to see that information. So these are the currently supported applications that will work as part as being connected apps into the Cloud App Security and ASM. If we go back to Investigate, I can then go through and click Files. This will then give me a list of files that are being accessed so I don't actually have to go through and look at the activity log and then pick out those ones. <coughs> Excuse me. I can actually click files and it will give me a filtered view. If I click accounts, this will do the same thing. But notice what I get this time. I can now do internal or external users. So I can now start to see who's coming in. So if I click external, you'll see that there's some accounts here. Obviously, these are just SPO accounts and then I have a, an application account that's being used. If I choose internal, then obviously these are the accounts that come through. But you'll see that we can quickly see accounts at this point. I can then drop onto here, and notice what I get this time. Because I'm looking at accounts, I can get taken to the Azure AD accounts settings, or I can then start to view really detailed information about the specific accounts. I can actually also come in and just say, suspend the user right now. Require the user to sign in again. Now obviously this is all based around you actively looking at the information and then being able to come into here and just say, bang, there we go, do that. So if I choose view owned files, <coughs> excuse me, this is now gonna do a different report. It's gonna say, go and get me the owner of the files and then I can see a list of everything here. So you can see it's very, very powerful. It's actually interrogating Microsoft SharePoint or other applications and now giving you, well, what are the files that that individual user owns? And of course, if we go back, I can then view the user page. We'll wait for this one to load. This will take me to my specific account. You'll see that my last activity was eight minutes ago. You'll see that I'm a member of all of the groups that's my Microsoft account. You can see there's my activity that's taken place. I can see there's a map which shows me exactly the locations that I will have come from. Notice that I can go through and say, well, in the last six months, show me the activity. And you'll see there's a few places that I've logged in. So obviously, Virginia seems to be the biggest one. Then we've got some places in Canada. There's some places in Europe. I think, I think that's, actually about, that's actually the Netherlands. That's when I was testing Tor. And then you can see the specific apps that I've been using as an individual. And then as we scroll down, you can see some basic activities. Obviously, there's no alerts. I can see the activity log. I can then see any reports that have been generated and a whole host of other information that comes through. So you can see it's very, very powerful that I can simply click on that object, the user, and get more information about you as the individual user at any point. So when you're trying to build a picture of the individual users of what's going on, using, I'm just gonna go back, using these kind of views, and then some of these options will give you a great insight into what your user's actually doing, which is really what ASM and Cloud App Security is all about. It's about knowing what your end users do. Now if I click on, the, if I click on alerts, you'll see that when, if there are any alerts, they will be listed here and you can see the resolution status. You can obviously navigate through the risk category. I can choose the apps if I need to. And obviously we use this color coded option where I can say show me high severity. Obviously I haven't had any alerts that have been uh, flicked up because I obviously try to be as safe as possible. But once you've gone through and looked at all the information, one of the things that you do have access to, especially in ASM, ASM is a, a smaller cut down version of the menu. Obviously, I'm using Cloud App Security, but I can do data enrichment, which basically means I can create IP addresses that are acceptable. Now, you'll notice in one of the policies, you could specify something that's not in an IP address that we kind of trust. This is where if you know, for example, that all the internet traffic is coming out of one IP address, for example, then you can come into here 
add that IP address so I can say, you know, maybe this is my office in Virginia. I can then say, for example, my IP address just just because. Um, let's say it's a 32 subnet. Oh, I should have saved that. 192.168.1.1. One slash thirty two, and then I can specify a location. I could specify that, for example, we're using AT and T, and any tags that I wish to add against that one. And then I can specify that it's either a corporate IP address, an admin IP address, something on a VPN, or even risky IP addresses. So you can come in and augment the information. So once you've added this as uh, an office, so I'm going to say create. That means that whenever it goes through and generates the reports or we go through the audit log that's there, it will now start to match those together. And so, for example, this IP address previously might have always got tagged as a risky IP address. But now that I've registered it as a corporate IP address, it's now not going to be flagged as a risky IP address. And plus, I've now told it that it's a registered IP. I could have added a location to that so we would know where that was. And I could have tagged it with any other number of, of words so it made sense to me as the person looking at the system. I can also do the same with user groups, where I can import user groups from Azure AD. Um, you'll look at automatic ones or imported. So I could say import user group. I could you know, select an app from here. I don't have an app connected. But I could actually import a group. So this is the 365 administrator. These are the external users. I could, for example, go into Azure AD um, or even the Office 365 admin, create a new security group, and then import that user group into here and specify the source apps and everything else. So then, once again, it will augment the results so we can start to weed out some of the, I suppose, what you would class as false positives. You also have some general settings and mail settings, which we won't go through. But what you also have is, if I go to the governance log, you can see that there are some governance tasks that you can also look into. So Active Directory imports, restore from an admin quarantine, restrict to collab uh, collaborators only, disable an app permission, the scanning for advanced. So all of this information is also logged. So this isn't just about users. This is about everything that takes place within your Office 365 tenant, whether it's an admin function, or whether it's an end user, or whether it's a specific application, whether someone's trying to run PowerShell, or whatever else it would be. Now, lastly in here, we have what's called log connectors. Now, in ASM specifically, it's not as advanced as the Cloud App Security version, but this is the ability for you to bring in a log file from on-premises. So you create the data sources. So I can say, this is my appliance. So you'll see we've got Blue Coat, Barracuda, Checkpoint, Cisco, all, all different types of firewalls that you can then export the log files out of. And then you're going to determine whether it's going to be an FTP or a syslog. And then once you've connected that data together, you'll then determine the automatic log collectors to be able to bring that in from those machines. So you have to have a component on the physical machines on premises that will then take those logs and push them out to Office 365. You can then say automatically upload those, and then it'll just take a little bit of time once it's been uploaded to actually augment the data. So then when you come into activity log, not only will you see me and basic Office 365, you'll now start to see information coming from your on-premises firewalls to augment the values, which means that you can then start to create better policies because you can say, oh, hey, well, if Steve is trying to connect on-premises to do something. So, so to give you a real-world type of example, I recently did some work for a specific client, and using ASM, we were able to find out that there were a set of individuals that had connected an Amazon Echo, Alexa, to Office 365, basically for calendar and email. And obviously, no one knew that had even happened. And that was the most important thing. No one knew 
until we walked through the ASM and the cloud app security and said, hey, hold on a minute, somebody has this application connected. And so instantly, they just went in and said, we're going to block the application. So that application was then blocked, and then a conversation was had with the, with the individuals to say, hey, you really shouldn't be just randomly connecting things to Office 365. So it's not that you're trying to control everything. I know it does look very Big Brother-like, that I, I can control, I can block, I can remove, I can suspend, but actually it's just about protecting your content that exists in your corporate environment. It's all about the IP that you own so that you can control it. Now if I choose app permissions here, what we'll see is the list of apps, and this is where you'll get the list. So for example, I have the Graph Explorer, which I'm sure some of you have used, 365, and then I created a demo API. And my demo API, if I click into it, is basically just calling out to a specific API uh, in SharePoint and trying to get information out. It's, it's kind of been authorized because admin consent, when I put the app into the organization, so if you don't know what that means, when you deploy the add-in to Office 365, you obviously deploy that in, and then there's a level of admin consent. So this one has already been consented by me. But if I wanted to, I could come in and say, mark the app as banned. At that point, it doesn't matter who authorized it, the app will get banned at that point, and I can then block access to that. So for example, we take the Graph Explorer, I could do exactly the same. I don't know why you would do that, but for the Graph Explorer specifically, but you could ban that app as needed. So I have the ability to not just ban individual users or suspend accounts, I can also ban applications from connecting. And that was in that real world idea where Alexa was connecting. That was a very simple process. It was like, hold on a minute, click ban, and it was banned at that point. I actually flick screens then, so let's go back. Um, actually click ban at this point. As soon as that's done, the app can no longer connect at that point. So as you can see, there's lots and lots. I can go into built-in reports because I'm in cloud app security. Some of these don't exist in ASM. But for example, I could do activity by location. And this will give me a specific rundown. These are just reports that you can run at any point. So I could click on US. And this will basically come back into here and then filter to the US. If I do custom reports, if I'm using Cloud App, then we don't have any, but I can go to discover, users, IP address, and I can create a snapshot report of the data, and then I run information from there. Now, because I'm using Cloud App, I can click the Cloud App catalog. Now, this is impressive to see where this gives me a list of all of the applications that Microsoft have given a score. And if I drop this list down and flick it the other way, to give you an idea of some of the apps that are at the lower end of that. So for example, there's a whole host of applications that have been given a score of nothing, or you can flick the other way and see applications that have been given a score of 10. And you can see the applications that are allowed to communicate backwards and forwards. Now, this is only part of Cloud App Security. This isn't part of ASM. So that's one big difference. The Cloud App Catalog has 13,000 applications that you can use, you can ban, you can allow, and you can see a score for those applications. And as you add your own applications, they will also get picked up, and you can then define a score for those applications too. So that kind of gives you an overview of ASM, and then obviously some of the cloud security management pieces that are there. So let me just flick back to my PowerPoint deck. OK, so when we look at advanced security management and then cloud app security, if we take the three buckets, so app discovery, data control, and threat prevention, you can see that there are some uh, major differences. In ASM, it's going to discover the apps that have similar functionality to 365, and you can do manual log upload only. If we compare that to cloud app security, it's 13,000 apps. It's ongoing risk assessment. It looks for anomaly detection for those apps. And you can do automatic log upload, too. For ASM, it uses existing Office 365 DLP. 
or basically unified DLP. You can use Azure AD Premium if you have that as part of your licensing for user and session control. And then you can identify control apps that are connected to 365 and you can revoke them at any point. If we're using cloud app security, I can do policy settings and enforcement. Uh, you can do DLP and data sharing controls as part of the sanctioned. You can identify and control apps. Uh, you can revoke access. And you can use, once again, Azure AD Premium for user session and control. But also, you can do SAML proxy for non-Azure AD customers, too. So an extra bonus as part of the data control. When you look at ASM again, it does anomaly detection and security alerts for 365. And you can do manual and automatic remediation. If we move to cloud app security, there's a dashboard. It shows the violations. It does threat detection and anomaly detection across all of the SaaS applications that you may have connected. And then, of course, it has manual or automatic remediation. So what are some of the key takeaways? Uh, the first one, purchase and assign your licenses. Um, even if you want to play, you can get a trial of ASM, uh, just like everything else in Office 365. So if you want to get the trial and assign the license in, uh, by all means, go ahead and do that. You don't actually have to purchase it after that. Um, an interesting thing is that even if a user doesn't have a license, the user is still picked up in ASM anyway. So even though you have to legitimately be licensed for every user, you could go through a trial process, assign the license into a few people, but then just use it to be able to look at information. But the moment that you decide to go forward, you need to purchase for everybody. Set up some basic alerts, not just in the alerts in the Security and Compliance Center, but obviously let it log the information and then go in through and create, create some basic alerts. If you're a global organization, then maybe you want to go through and augment that with the IP address ranges and then start to block anybody that comes in from an IP address that you don't know. Combine that with the audit log searching, which isn't part of ASM. That's just part of Office 365. You can just go into the standard audit log search, perform searches, and then create alerts based on that. So you've got these two components that work together. You've got the audit log that's capturing everything. You can create alerts for that piece. And then you have the, the big brother of that, which is ASM, capturing all of the specific activities and things that you would class as violations if they were to happen. Um, utilize on-premises log uploads to augment the data. It's actually really powerful when you have it to be able to put them in. But obviously, you need to make sure that your application you're using as your perimeter protection um, is actually supported as far as a log upload goes. And then finally, trial the cloud app security. Um, just the same as ASM. If you want to go to the big brother and do everything, then re in reality, if you wanted to do a full trial of security management in Office 365, um, you're going to take your existing license. So let's say you have an E3. You'll add on the E3 plus security. You'll add on the cloud app security, and then you won't need the ASM license at that point because your cloud app security supersedes the ASM license. Those will be the trial licenses that you'll need to apply so that you can then start to do the simple things that we walk through today. OK, so it's that time. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Liam. Um, we have a couple of questions um, already here. So if you still have some questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A. I think we just start uh, with the very first of them. We have uh, five more minutes to go, so I'm pretty sure we can handle all those within okay. the time frame. First question comes from Anthony, and he says that he's pretty sure that ASM also is part of Office 365 F1 product of the suite. Uh, is that correct? Yes. OK. Short and precise. <laughs> Next question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, is there more to the story? <laughs> Feel free to elaborate. I didn't mean to cut you there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not, 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 not for that one. No, no. <laughs> okay, cool. There is a there is a different set of there is a different set of licensing too. So the interesting thing is, if you purchase the licenses yourself and you go into Office three sixty five, then you just kind of get the sets of licenses that are there. However, 
you can also get very strange sets of licensing if you decide if you purchase them through a CSP, so a cloud service provider that obviously a registered one with Microsoft. They actually have a whole different set of licensing. So I actually went through this with a client. So if you're if you purchase your licensing through a CSP, don't just expect to pay or get the license that's there. Go and speak to the CSP because they will be able to offer you a whole different skew of licensing that may include or exclude certain features. So that's kind of one of those areas that you, it's it's easier to go and speak to them. Um, I actually went through this with a client recently and they got access to ASM via a different SKU license that you wouldn't normally be able to purchase. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, next question from VJ. Um, he can't get access to these data programmatically to report on activity log. Um, is there a way to do that? And um, so there's no kind of external API to be able to call into bits and pieces there. Um, you do have some level of PowerShell access to be able to get information, but um, the whole idea is for you to go into the application itself to get that information. In the future, there may be um, some extra endpoints that become available. There is one area that is available in Office 365 and parts of ASM, and it's the, there's a service API that's available. It isn't very feature rich. The idea behind that is really based around if you're using System Center on premises, that you can actually hook into the service API and retrieve a whole host of information. For example, like audit log information and bring that back down to System Center. So that's the only entry point that you've got right now. That that may change in the future, but I'm I'm not on the ASM team, so I'm not 100% sure. All right. Uh, last question for now from Alexander. Um, he asks, can we use a policy as a template, uh, export and import for use later? Um, so right now, the, there's, there's no real ability for you to say, I've created a policy, and I want to save it as a template type thing. Um, there, there will be functionality. I know at least that one um, is a feature that they're working on. But right now, you're just going to use either no template or an existing template and then create a policy based on top of that. Um, it's all about the construct underneath um, that it doesn't know how to retrospectively take a policy that you've created based on your personal parameters and create that as a template. All right, perfect. So since there's no more questions, I think we're through for today. Thank you very much, Liam, for your time and for this great presentation. Very interesting stuff. Um, we already received a lot of uh, excellent feedback around this webinar as well. Um, well thank you. <laughs> what pleasure was all mine and ours. <laughs> um, for everyone who's still here, quick announcement. Uh, the next Renko webinar in August that will be coming up, um, presented by our very own Irvin van Hoonen. He will talk about how to provision artifacts to SharePoint Online without being a developer. So if you want to sign up uh, with that, go to renko.com slash media slash webinar on our website, sign up with the form, and you will be registered to go. And August 24th is the date. 6 p.m. European time is the time. 16 p.m., sorry about that. Um, with this, I want to end this today's webinar. Thank you very much for hanging out. Uh, we're perfectly in time for the first time, I think. So, Liam, <laughs> a special award for you. I have thank, to you thank you, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, thanks again, Liam, for, um, for hanging out with us for the great presentation. And have a great rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.